This class is by Ed Janowak, the new, proud to announce, Manager of Design Education with ACA. It's a pretty big deal that he got that position. It's well-deserved, as you'll see in this video. In this class, Ed covers duct design, Manual D. This is from the second annual HVACR Symposium in Claremont, Florida. If you want to find out more about how to attend this year, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. I think you'll enjoy this class. It's a long one, but you will definitely learn a lot about duct design if you stick through it. This May, we went over this stuff before. I was in a well, current life, previous life. I spent 15 years in a service truck, so I don't get up here and tell you stuff because I read it in a book. I've lived it. Uh, I've done the things that you're not supposed to do. I've put screws into things that let stuff out that's not supposed to. I've put my foot through ceilings where that's where the new return went. You know, there's some stuff I'm not necessarily proud of, but, you know, you do what you got to do. We're in a house in Tuckerton. Billy's in the attic. I hear the plywood starting to crack, and without skipping a beat, I'm sitting at the kitchen table across from the homeowner. She's every bit of 80. His foot comes through the ceiling and lands on the top of her refrigerator. She takes a deep drag off her Pall Mall, it blows it out and says, how are you going to take care of that, honey? And I said, we're going to take the heat off the back of your refrigerator and put it right in that return and help distribute it throughout the, whole, the entire house. And I'm not making this up because that's exactly where we put a return, in her kitchen above the fridge. So I've done as much stuff that's wrong as right. It's just that I've learned the math behind doing it right. I've done the, the bad duct systems, and now I make duct systems that don't require the occupant to turn the TV up when the system comes on. And isn't that our goal? Right? People are so callous to the fact that the air is supposed to make noise. I have had people call me after the fact and say, I'm not 100% sure if this is working right because I can't hear it run. I've taken pieces of string or ribbon and tied them to diffusers. So they do this when they run so they know it. But I, I can, I'll never forget it. I had this woman go through that whole uh, explanation. Her son was there. Ma, why don't you have the air on? I do. I'm not sure. You can't hear it. Uh, and when I got there, I'm like, what do you have the thermostat set at? Well, it's 76. If we keep it 73 now, it's too cold in here. We took care of their humidity problem. It, it was the first time I had a, a comment. I'm not going to call it a compliment because she didn't realize she was complimenting me. I went outside, and I, and I can't dance. But I was dancing, baby. It was a big deal. Not only did we do her house, we did like three or four other houses on that street. And that's what, you know, the word of mouth. Uh, we were talking to somebody uh, over the course of this week about them starting their own business and advertisements and stuff. In the 15, 17 years, I owned my own business for actively contracting for three or four I never paid a penny in, in advertisement. So, there, yeah, it's the word of mouth. Is a, when I had my business, I ended up doing more of this than that, which I like talking about it better than doing it. I've never done a class in a hot attic. So there's that, right? <laughs> All right, so. No, I, I don't want to. So like it says, chucking a truck in the HVAC industry. I, I still do some work. I try to avoid it but I still do it. Oh, I wanted to wait until we were, we were live. I wanted to tell you my shirt story. So I bought these shirts that when uh, we're warm, when I get warm, they're supposed to unwrinkle. And I just went and used the bathroom, and that one has a mirror in it. And I was like, my shirt's wrinkled. And I went to iron it this morning, but when I plugged the, the iron in at the hotel, it smelled like grilled cheese. And I'm pretty sure whoever the bleepity bleep was in there before me made some dinner because I pulled the coffee pot out, and I wouldn't use that because it smelled like chicken soup. So somebody was having a smorgasbord with stuff that I don't know why. So if my shirt's wrinkled, sorry, but it's wrinkled for a reason. Yeah, oh, I'll be there next year, no doubt. All right, so that's me, and this kind of goes a little bit more of an accelerated uh, uh, version than what you saw this morning. Even though I like talking about myself, it's kind of... It's kind of boring, but I got more pictures. And these down here just show, I, I do local stuff for my utility programs. I do local stuff like 
for cash or for, for pay, uh, actual system installs. And that's, that's the uh, ESCO thing the last time they had it in Vegas, the train the trainer stuff. They're my favorite events, uh, especially talking about these kinds of topics because, again, I don't want to exaggerate the numbers, but I bet I have supplied manual S and manual D information to, you know, directly, not through classes, but them contacting me. I give everybody access to my drop boxes. I'm stealing most of this information from somebody else, so I'm just sharing the wealth, if you will. So it's good stuff. Actually, that's not true. Most of this content is mine, but who cares? I'm not in competition with anybody. If you're on social media and you're like, I kind of, that name or whatever, and you've seen that picture, that's me. Right? And that literally is me in 1966. That's Uncle Leon, and he was a bit of a weird dude, and I kind of take after him. And that's a compliment to him and I think to me. But he thought it was funny to put a lit cigarette in a kid's mouth that wasn't two years old yet. So, finally quit last week after all those years, but actually I quit about 15 years ago. But I'm actually one of those weirdos that can have like one cigarette a month if I want. I always wanted to be that person and I kind of am now. So I'm going to be finding you house later and, and mooching a smoke. <laughs> All right, my market. This we didn't get into last time, and I want to elaborate a little bit more on this. I live in New Jersey, and I live in the good part of New Jersey, where it's not city-like. It's very, uh, well, it's a garden state. I live on the outskirts of a million acres of pine trees that are like little pine trees around here. There's just no palm trees near them. So it's really not that much different. Uh, these are the markets that I'm actively working in right now. Where I live is considered mid-Atlantic, southern New England. So I don't have cold like the weirdos that live in Minneapolis cold. No thank you. But it gets cold. I've seen minus six in my car driving through one of the colder sections. So it gets cold where I live. We, we test our furnaces, and they only run 20% of the time out of the hour, even when it's minus six like everywhere else in the country. We don't know how to size them things either. It gets hot once in a while. 104 is the hottest I've ever seen it in the town I live in. But we've had stretches where from summer to summer, we might only see 10 or 15 hours above 90 degrees. So why would you want to size a piece of equipment for 104 when you might only spend 20 hours in an entire summer above 90? And obviously the answer is you don't want to. Trust the math, trust the process, all that, and you can enjoy those predictable results. That's what we're after. And we see some real ugliness. We see conditions that are akin to what takes place right here in Claremont, not with the duration, but enough that we have duct work that drips. And it's, uh, I'm a bad person because I love it. I preach this stuff, do this or you're going to have a problem, do this or you're going to have a problem. I go to an ACA meeting and I got guys saying, Man, that stuff never happens. Uh, let's see, it's going to be the summer of 20, which was kind of humid, 19 wasn't, 18 was. And I would be in a crawl space or an attic or a house with one of those contractors. And I'm like, you believe me now? Because I'm in the house because the duct work's dripping. Right? It's, this stuff is eventually going to happen. You, you guys don't have to wait that long before it happens. Right? You do something wrong and two days later, get over here. It, sometimes it'll take us 18 months. It takes a while for us to get a string of that wet. It's coming, but it takes a while. So I don't, I don't think I live in a unique area, but I think I live in an area that represents about two-thirds of the country. right? So I, I feel everyone's pain, so to speak, about what you deal with. Do we want to avoid the problems? Yes. Can we avoid the problems? Yes, and we do it by following the guidance. right? And the guidance is... Not just manual J, not just manual S, not just manual D, but using them all together. That's the, again, the predictability. I, I, I really like that word. I'm not a big fan of Sandy. That's exactly where I live. If you guys are familiar with Sandy, uh, what do you think that is? Yeah, that's sand. That's, that's not snow. Uh, that's what 30% of the houses in my area looked like after that storm. So they've been replaced with these, right? Our customers have money, right? And they want to spend it, baby. 
you take one of those houses that exists, like that real quaint looking place, and you knock it, you, you pay 800 for it, and you knock it down, you spend 500, and you build that, and it's worth two. They have 2%, 3% of their total budget to spend on mechanicals. If they're going to be there 12 months out of the year, they're getting radiant heat, man. If they're only going to spend six weeks of summer there, they're going with low bid and they're getting three oversized furnaces and three oversized air conditioners. But the good thing is they oversize the air conditioners. They don't last that long, so they only have to deal with it for a, a, a shortened period of time. Sandy came ashore in 12, right? These houses were all fixed in 13. Most of those condensing units need to be changed in the next year or two already. Yeah, it's pretty cool, man. Oh, yeah, the furnaces will last, you know, 20, 25 years. You go through three condensing units for, for one furnace. So it works out pretty good. And who doesn't like doing a, a condenser change out for 18000 right? During the summer when they're renting that house for ten five a week, it's like, I don't know if I can get there today. Oh, ten grand? Yeah, I can get there today. So a little bit of a, maybe I'm not, maybe I am. I don't know. I'm a dad. Uh, I'm very proud of this. Uh, that's my kid. It's a few years ago, but that's one of the, again, I say I live in Jersey, and people are, oh, oil refineries. That was right down the street from the house I was living in at the time. So it, it's pretty nice. There she is in the house we presently live in. She knows how to measure airflow. She's quite adept at it. Adept, adapt, adept. She worked at the Contemporary, what's that, half hour, 40 minutes uh, away. She did the Disney College program a couple of years ago. Oh, look at that, I'm wearing the same shirt. Isn't that convenient? <laughs> It's wrinkled there, too. I bet they were making cheesesteaks in the room that day. One of the best days of my life right there. You do the take your kids to work day? That was the first time I ever got to do that. The college she attends, which is right outside New York City, Montclair State University or MSU, has a lot to do with this class. I talk a lot about make shit up, MSU, not Montclair State University, but it's make shit up, don't make shit up, right? So anyway... They asked me to do a, not the college, a distributor, rented rooms at the college, said, would you come do a, a class? They give us free uh, time in their training rooms. So I had to say yes, and I'm like, all right, I'll do it. Here's my kid's schedule, no conflicts, and that was good. Uh, anybody use uh, EWC controls for the uh, John Brown? Name ring a bell? John was sitting next to my daughter, and I was doing my same stupid joke. She got to do the punchlines to my jokes. That was a cool day. That was a big day for me. And whoever the photographer from, that's from Universal, that's who rented the, the stuff, they, uh, they had a good uh, a photographer there. That was, a, that was a big deal. And that's her and the boy. She's known as the kid. That's the boy. And that's the most uh, recent picture I have of all of them. My wife, that's me. He's currently a cop in Baltimore. So he, he's a, a pretty ballsy guy, I guess is a good way to say it. He's probably going to end up down here. He's been doing some interviews, so... Um, if any of you guys live around here, I might be calling you asking for advice as to where I should move or where I shouldn't. So we'll see what happens. All right, that's enough uh, of that stuff. I, I, if I could get away with just talking about that stuff, I would. <laughs> i got to have some fun, too. All right, this is what we're going to do. <clears throat> we're going to talk about selecting fans. We're going to look at what happens when we try and make a good duct system. And then it's all going to wind up at the end where I don't think ACCA does a good job of forcing you to follow up. Or at least it's not in the book, right? I got people in here that use external static pressure to estimate airflow, right? Yes, right? And that's also the same information that we use to design our ductwork. How often do you look for those numbers to match? Right? And you should be, and some people do, but a lot of times they don't. And we're going to walk through the process. I'm going to show you why they come out good, and I'm going to show you why they come out ba bad. I think he split, but Hausch was in here before. I've seen a couple of his things where he's using numbers that just make my eye twitch every time I look at them. But he's not taking some of the stuff into account the exact same way I don't take stuff into account because that's my safety factor. But I end up with external static pressures or, that are lower than I anticipate, which is fine because we can always make that work exactly how we want. But when we have external static pressures that are higher than desirable, we
we got to start giving stuff back, and sometimes that hurts, or we just can't do it. So I'm going to explain that. So I'm going to go through the design part of it at a pretty rapid pace. Again, we can't teach Manual D in two hours. I'm going to try, especially if I waste all that time showing you pictures of my kid. It's a good thing we have a computer, because I'd be here with my wallet. Yeah, I'd be going up in there. You see it? Isn't she cute? You know, that kind of stuff. So. Again, I haven't looked at this in a while, so I've got to read this and figure out what I'm doing next. So the testing after the fact, uh, some of the stuff you already know, yeah, and I, I want you to use this stuff. And I'm thinking that you're not completely proficient with manual D at this point, and that's why you're here, and you're in the right place. So thanks for hanging out with me. All right, we've got to manage expectations of the com uh, for the customer when it comes to this. You can't have a 70 degree house on a 100 degree day and have a good dehumidification on part load days. I know when it's going to be 90 degrees in my market, I can make a house comfortable rather easily because the system runs a lot. When it runs a lot, it does all the good stuff. Dehumidification's taking place, air mixing's taking place, that's easy. So what is the, the struggle, right? Part load conditions, 82 degrees in gray. What's the driver behind making the system run? Right? Sensible BTUs, if they're not there, the system isn't going to run. Have you ever told a customer to open the blinds when it's only 80 degrees out? I have. Think about that for a second. Hottest day of the year at your own house, do you close the blinds? I do, because I'm smart. I don't know what it says about you, but <laughs> I know these guys, so I can get away with that. But it, don't tell anybody, but he couldn't figure out what a pound of airways before. Yeah. So just keep that. <laughs> they got to figure it out now, so it's a strong comeback. I like that. <laughs> but we got to manage the expectations of the occupant. If somebody doesn't have a poignant conversation with what do you think is going to happen or what you can expect to happen, you're already putting yourself in that butt kicking line, and we're trying to stay out of it, right? So that's how that goes. I want to remind you that it's important to manage your expectations when you come to an event like this also. You know where this is going, don't you? Keep in mind who's up here right now. All right? Got a little snow. I'm out there with the torch. Best $18 with the coupon I ever spent at Harbor Freight. Man, you want to feel like a superhero? You pull the trigger on that thing, man. You get a flame coming out of it. That's good stuff right there. Uh, I'll let you decide. Uh, it's one of the two. The yeah. I saw him. I did this before. He copied me. He yeah, he got, all 18 people that saw me on TikTok told him about it, and he put his up there. All right. Remember, this is how it appears. Are you ready? Because that's what it really looks like. All right? <laughs> No, it's a, is it? Red, red, no, that's the tan red, one. That's the color of the photo. So I told Brian when I was going to do this, I said, I want a boom mic. I'm going to sit down and do my class, and I'm going to do them exactly like I do them at home in my basement. He said, like, I don't care what you do. And I said, I'm always in my drawers when I'm doing the classes because I think that's funny. And uh, he laughed pretty, pretty good for a while, and then he said, well, what kind do you wear? <laughs> and I'm like, it's, it, it's definitely PG. So if you ever see any of my YouTube videos or any of that, you're not going to scrub that from your brain because that's it, man. It's just, I guess the first time I wore pants since the pandemic set in, you know? I, why? I have like three different shirts. That's all I wear. And it's, <laughs> it's the same shirt. It's not. That's actually a, a tan one from the Cabela's, Cabela's collection. Uh, yeah, it's the same brand. It's a Sipowitz shirt. Is there anybody old enough to get the Sipowitz? <laughs> NYPD Blue, there was the real gruff guy. Called everybody a scumbag. He always had a plaid short sleeve shirt and a tie on. And he was the, yeah, Sipowitz. This is my Sipowitz shirt. So, you, you, you know, remember Sipowitz? Andy Sipowitz. Yeah, he was a little gruff. All right. Uh, we already know that this system is going to move 1,000 CFM because we went over it in the last session, and I blew through it quickly, but it kind of lends itself. We are going to cover it right now, eventually. Manual D. Manual D requires that we pick a fan. 
And then what are we going to do after we pick the fan? We're going to design a system around our fan. Manual Q, which is its counterpart for commercial duct design, is the exact opposite. We just make up a duct size, and then we pick a fan big enough to overcome the restriction of the ductwork. In commercial duct systems, do we care about noise? No, it's part of it. We want the background noise. In a commercial application, we want that constant airflow. Remember before you were talking about air coming in nonstop? We're going to treat it. We're going to address it so we can let it run all the time. Webster defines comfort as not being aware of your surroundings. If a fan's coming on and off, if it makes noise, we're going to be aware of it. That's not comfort. If a system runs nonstop, it blends into the background, it can be a little bit louder, and it's acceptable because we're not going to notice it because it's always there. In an office environment, it's welcomed. It gets rid of the noise of these people outside here that won't shut up. You know, it's, it, it kind of takes it so that those noises kind of blend into the background. With, and white noise is generally what it's referred to. So it's on purpose. Yeah, and he just said about an office building. That's a perfect example of it. Exactly. And if I really wanted to be that guy, I was going to repeatedly say what when you said that because he started off, you can't hear. And again, there's something wrong with me because that's just funny. All right. So we got to take our pressure losses into account. I'm old enough that man the friction rate worksheet in Manual D said... Device losses, now they're called component losses. But I'm updated. This is the only manual D presentation that it actually says component losses. And you got to be a big old dork with this stuff to even know what I'm talking about right now. But I'll point it out when we get there. We're going to design ducts to accommodate our fan pressure. Now, a couple of you guys are going, what is that? Does that help you? All right. All right. That looks more like what you're doing. Okay. Code compliance, we're back to this whole code thing. These are my local codes, and they talk about where specifically all this information is coming from. So mechanical code or energy conservation code, they specify uh, the ACA design series. Again, I don't care if you want to follow code or not, but I want it to be a conscious decision. If you want to get into the purposeful defiance and all that, I want to warn you that you can never say, I didn't know, because if you are at the discovery phase or you actually end up in court saying, I didn't know, you might as well just say, uh, here's my checkbook, write yourself a check, because it's not a plausible defense. You're responsible for doing your due diligence. Again, I want to emphasize that code is a minimum standard. It is not solely responsible for predictability that we seek, but it's the path to it. It's the minimum stuff we should be doing. All right, to design a, a, a quality duct system, we need to know how many BTUs and CFM need to be delivered. In this example right here, I got a heat gain of 22,000 BTUs with a sensible heat ratio of 0.9. I got a heat loss of 31,000 BTUs. Does that sound like something that could be in your area? Not yours. It, your, your loss is double your gain, pretty similar to mine. I don't know where these numbers came from. But I, I don't know. I just made them up. Manual J gives us the BTU loss and gain. Manual S gives us guidance on that airflow. I do more stuff writing it on this little uh, dry erase board that I bought at the dollar store than I do anything else. Because it, it looks more like a piece of cardboard that I picked up off the ground on a job site. And I think that's where that, it, it feels right to me. I'm doing the math here. The math tells me that my total BTU gain was 22K, and there are my sensible BTUs. It tells me that my sensible heat ratio is 0.9, and I'm doing the math as per manual S. It tells me 1,011 CFM is my target airflow, so that's close enough to 11. If you don't understand that, shame on you. You could have learned it a couple hours ago or you can use the password that you got for attending here and look at that class, and I've already done it. It was pretty good. I watched it, and the, me walking up to that camera's quality content. I like that. 
I actually did look to see if the whole thing worked. And while I was standing in line to get the, the what was it? What did Brian call it? God's chick, the Lord's chicken. Yeah, I was waiting in line for that. It worked that fast. So they got that whole thing working out uh, fairly well. Not 400 CFM per ton. Just putting that out there in case you were curious. That's our gain. Our starting airflow, where we're going to look in the extended performance data, is at 1,000. My heat loss is here using a rule of thumb. It's a quality rule of thumb, but it's a rule of thumb nonetheless. That's what my heating airflow is going to be. Again, at least to start before I make some uh, massages to it. Uh, it's some, I can't come up with words, so I use whatever pops into my head. And that's weird that I said that that's what popped into my head, but I digress. This is the equipment that we selected. It happens to be a VRV system with a bunch of numbers after it. Its capacity is 26,800 BTUs. My heat gain is 22,000 BTUs. At 1,000 CFM, I look at the correct spot, <clears throat> excuse me, on my extended performance data, and it's telling me my total capacity is 26.8. If I take my total capacity and multiply it by 130%, it tells me that my ceiling or my limit for this VRV technology falls within the 30% limitation that is the guidance in manual S. So what are we going to get? A thumbs up, right? We're there. I'm sorry. Right. I had to cover that. Everything else moving forward is going to be about ducks. And I promise. Or I pinky promise. No more equipment selection stuff. It's all going to be at duck work. Yes, sir. The definition of comfort? Tell get the dictionary out. Webster. He's the dude who writes the dictionary. Right? The de definition of comfort is not being aware of your surroundings. So it's just not temperature or humidity. It could be if I hear it, if it's blowing on my neck. You know, that's all part of the design series. The ACA design series has specific language that talks about the occupied zone. Two feet in from the exterior walls, from the floor to the ceiling. I think the number is 40 feet per minute velocity. We want to keep the air under that. But above and out at the exterior walls, it's like Animal House, man. There's a party going on. You can have that air moving at any velocity you want because, well, who's the tallest person in the room? I guess this guy with the beard, he's a big deal. Are you over six foot? Okay. Oh, yeah. It, he might get it in the forehead, maybe even in the nose, that air that's moving too fast. But he's just going to have to walk. Well, that's how he flies. Yeah. I got my ponytail down the back of my shirt. I don't want to show off, you know. It's just. <laughs> I need this a little bit longer so I can do the twist and tuck it back up underneath so it's tight. It's just not there yet. My daughter thinks it's cool. My wife hates it. So uh, I'm talking to this, this company about something, and I'm like, yeah, they want me to cut my beard. My wife's like, yeah. I'm like, they didn't say that. Are you? I'm looking like one of the founding fathers. Come on. The friction rate worksheet. I, somebody brought it up before. They asked, do I have any music on here? i got to cue the music right now. You ready? I'm kidding. No, it's not anything you're going to do. I'm going to do it. The friction rate worksheet. Uh -huh. Or how about that? Is that too much? I think it's pretty good. That document right there forces you to do everything that you need to do to do a good duct design. Right? Look at step one. What does step one ask for? External static pressure. And it asks us what our airflow is. Step two, our pressure drops. Step three, if you didn't know what a st available static was before, you're going to find out because all you got to do is fill in the blanks. Everything about that document forces you to do a good duct design. Because if some of the numbers come out where they're not big enough, you can't proceed. It's why you can't randomly say that your friction rate's supposed to be 0.08 or 0.05 or whatever magic number you want to use, if we don't have enough available static right there, it's not going to work. It doesn't mean no air is going to come out of the vents, but a predictable amount isn't. And we seek that predictability.
Right? So we're going to go the whole process. Let's do it. Step one, it's like I said, that is going to be external static pressure versus my CFM. Our component losses, I always called them device losses because that's what the old sheet said. Available static pressure, we got to go through TEL, the longest circulation path. We, we got to cover that. I'm going to go under the assumption everybody already knows what effective length is. We're going to apply it to ductwork. We're going to take that ductwork and look at some charts, and it's going to tell us what our effective length is for each individual fitting. Some of these are, yeah, it makes sense. And some of them are like, whoa, I had no idea. And there's stuff that, it's nothing short of bizarre. You can go to the supply house and they'll sell some of these fittings. And they're not the better choice. And the one that's the better choice, they don't sell. But what do you sell? You sell what people are buying. And people are buying the wrong fittings. It's bizarre. I did uh, training for uh, a company, and I won't mention them by name, <coughs> Gray Metal. And I was at their factory doing a class. They have a duck slide with the wrong effective length on the fittings, and a couple of their guys that work there, were like, I'm doing my thing. So, what you're saying is wrong. No, what, I, I wasn't going to touch this, but now that you brought it up, what's on your duck slide is wrong. Because when I looked in here, it agreed with me, right? And they're, ooh, oh, geez. Well, they're giveaways. That's a suspenseful thing, isn't it? I warned you, I'm like a 12-year-old. But I want to see uh, three happy people. Everybody look under your seat and see if you got a piece of blue tape. You might have to stand up and look. I got one. Got another one? You picked the right seat. There you go. Anybody else? There it is. Yeah, I got a little applause. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, my name ain't in that one. My name's in S. So really is. Page four. See, I know the pa page 30, right? That's where that, that, yeah. I kept thinking about that because I forgot to give them out the same way first go around. So the lucky guys that came up to talk to me afterwards, they got them. So that worked out pretty well. Anyway, again, I'm like a 12-year-old. I can't help with that. A little insight to the world of Ed. It's a little scary. <laughs> All right, we're going to go through this. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to go through this entire process. There's our friction rate worksheet. We already determined that our target airflow is 1,000 CFM because we were able to meet the, the sensible, meet the late, and not exceed the total by 15, 20, or 30 percent. 1,000 CFM. We're going to go and find a furnace. We needed, uh, what was it, 31,000 BTUs. This 40,000 BTU furnace has enough capacity. And I'm looking at something with this constant torque ECM motor. The dip switches are set like this. I got 0.7. That's where I'm starting off with for my external static pressure, very close to that 1,000 CFM number that I need. Wait a second. Are you guys cool with the external static pressure thing? Did you sit on Steve's thing before, or do you need a little more? Let's do a little more. And I want to talk about this one for a second because it relates to something, again, that I like to talk about with this stuff. Does anybody recognize this drawing where you might have seen it? Does anybody go on True Tech Tools at all? Have you ever seen some of the free downloads they have on True Tech? I'm guessing at this, the first part, but I'm going to say Bergman originally put this on True Tech Tools back 10 years ago, 12 years ago. But I know the guy who originally drew it, and he was using it in a class here in Orlando two years ago, 
And when that drawing popped up, I almost said, why are you using my stuff? Until I realized that I got it from him. And I started using it like 15 years ago. So if you guys have ever been to the dealertoolbox.com, Chris Mahali is the ECM trainer for Gentech. He was the original person that drew this. So if you ever see this one and him, again, he was the original. He did that, I think, before he worked for Gentech. So anyway, I stole the diagram because Chris's original diagram had an incline manometer on it. And do you even know what an incline manometer is? You don't need to. It's like you're using an abacus or your phone to do math, right? So it's modern stuff. If you want the really cool one, go talk to Captain America over there about getting the, the DG8. I've been playing with one of them for a while. I got one on the, the leg of my uh, crappy table in my basement, and I have a hose that goes into my Bilco door so I can measure stack effect in my basement and talk about that. And I have another hose that when I built the house, I ran a piece of PEX into my attic so I can look at the pressure in my attic at any given time just by well, holding it up because I have a, a tube. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. Anyway, uh, Jim was very nice at the lunchtime thing when he said that some of these other manometers, that's a good manometer for measuring static pressure. That's a good manometer for measuring the combustion appliance zone pressures and things of that nature. That's a random number generator if you stick it in the vent of a water heater. That's a micro manometer that'll give you an accurate measurement. So that's the difference between the two. Static pressure, real simple. The first word describes it in its entirety. It's static. What's that mean? Not that it gives you a shock, no. Say motionless. What was it? Motionless. motionless. Yeah, he got it. Stagnant, not in motion. So our, our fan, it blows up the ductwork and creates pressure, and then it also gives us flow. That static pressure, right, outward force within a duct, external static pressure, the way we use it is to match it to blower data, and the manufacturers were nice enough to put the furnace on a table and hook a contraption to it. You can estimate your airflow based off of that pressure. And sometimes they weren't real nice to us. Sometimes they make up numbers. They'll take it at two or three uh, points on the, the chart, and then they extrapolate the other numbers. I don't like that. I want these things to be accurate. So. And you already guys, you know what a pressure drop is, so I won't even say that one. Static pressure, how do we measure it? Or external static pressure, how do we measure it? Well, with a manometer. Uh, incline manometer, that's it. Yeah. If, you, if you forget to open the, the one end, yeah, you, brown your shirt. No, hopefully not the customer's shirt. Right. Good way, good way, good way to take all kinds of measurements, right? Better way, if you want to take those real small measurements, uh, most cost-effective way to take those real small measurements that you might be interested in. There's Chris's drawing, and Chris was very impressed with himself when he made that wheel spin. I have a real blower wheel in mine that makes it spin, so again, fourth grade, baby. I'm up to that. <laughs> well, that's not good. It, it, that's one of them old-fangled things, not one of them new-fangled things. So manual D helps us with this stuff. What does it do? It tells us don't allow the air to move greater than 500 feet per minute across that, return, that stamped steel grill. Why don't, want, why don't we want the air moving faster than that? Noise. Noise, right? Those grills will start to hum. Everybody knows why they hum, right? Because they don't know the words. Come on! When my kid was in that class, she got to do that punchline, and it was a big deal to me. So, uh, Filter grills, 300 feet per minute. Keep that velocity in check, so to speak, when the air goes across the filter. We're going to talk about filters and what a bunch of dirt bags the filter manufacturers are for not telling us the truth. And then I'll, I'll take that back and say they're just following the rules, but we have to watch how they're following the rules. Uh, 52.2, the ASHRAE standard for filters. They have to publish MERV and pressure drop at one of seven different velocities. The lowest velocity is 143 or 149 feet per minute. It's that friggin' metric system again. Because it's something about some milliliters or something. I don't know what it is, but they're not numbers we're used to. I'm used to 300 feet per minute, but it's 297 because of metric. But they will publish their numbers at velocities that we rarely achieve, and we see these numbers that we like. 
like 0.08 and 0.1. We're like, yeah, that filter. But we're, if we're using the 25 by 16 opening on the side of that furnace with a three-ton drive, that opening mathematically converts to 500 feet per minute. Now I got a 0.4 drop across the filter that I wanted to use. Would you ever use a 0.4 drop in a filter? No. That's why if you fill out the friction rate worksheet, it's, I like using the phrase, you know, that predictability or the keys to the kingdom. Velocity through return trunks. Max, 700 feet per minute. I like to keep them at 600. Then I know I'm never going to have noise and everything's going to be good. If I'm putting them in the unconditioned space, I want to run my velocities at the max. But if they're in the conditioned space, I try and keep them under. You're going to see a chart. It'll all make sense. <clears throat> the pressure drop has to be a real pressure drop, not assumed. We got to look it up. Depending on how time goes, we might be able to look that up today. Pressure drops across the coil. It is not uncommon to see 0.3 drops across evaporator coils. If we have a 0.3 drop across here and a 0.2 drop across here, we better have a whole lot of oomph coming out of that blower. That's why seeing numbers of 0.7 and 0.8 and 0.9 aren't out of the realm of possibilities. And you'll have people that are fixated on 0.5 from a furnace. And I can't emphasize enough that that's, that's just a load of crap. And finally, furnace manufacturers have started to publish. You can run this thing between 0.15 and a full inch because that's realistically where it's going to happen. I've literally stood in technical committee meetings yelling at people that I like and saying, you know, you're wrong and they're telling me I'm wrong and, you know, on the ground, headlocks, knees to the groin. Well, I'm exaggerating maybe a little. Maybe it was a knee to the midsection. But people have very strong opinions of this stuff and it's all been solved just by a manufacturer finally publishing stuff that is the way it should be. So that makes me feel better. So if you want to use a coil with a big pressure drop, you can, because it's legit. Yes, sir? You do in the worksheet, do you, um, like a wet coil runs a higher component loss, right, than a dry coil. Are you changing that for heating or just leaving it? Nah, it's, you have a little extra that you can use later. One of my big things, and the question was, if you have a design for a wet coil, but then you check it with a dry coil, you're going to see different numbers. And that's, that's a fact. If it's going to be dry and heating and you want to slow your fan down a little bit, not to meet your numbers, good. But leave it where your original design was because when, and I don't want to say that it's always more airflow required for cooling because it's not true, but we want to keep that wet coil uh, in our design and our setup when it runs in cooling because it's going to be wet then. There's, there's a bunch of fluff in the friction rate worksheet that I'm okay with. And ultimately, if we test it at the end, we can adjust. And if we have that, that extra, the extra, let's just call it extra. It's never going to hurt us because we can always slow the fan down. It hurts us when we don't have enough and we can't always speed the fan up. Because that usually entails reducing the effective length and you can't always do that. If we're already on high speed, we can't make it go any faster. And then it gets into changing the blower. And you don't change a blower. You change the whole air handler, fan coil, or, or furnace. So it depends. If your blower, the question is, where do you take this reading? As far, I'm doing it after the filter here because this furnace does not, this manufacturer does not publish its data, including a filter. It's pretty rare that they publish with a filter anymore. I saw a YouTube video, and not to pick on YouTube, but I'm going to pick on YouTube, where a guy said something about, yeah, you got to take the pressure drops across the secondary heat exchanger into account. And as much as it hurt my wrist, I reached right through that computer and grabbed them by the throat. Because that's not true. But he also was saying that if you set your duct slide at 0.1, you'll have a 0.1 static pressure in the, uh, the supply duct. And then I went to Staples and bought a new monitor because I took my phone and I smashed my computer screen. So I stopped gouging my eyes because that was doing permanent damage. I'm going to call him in a few weeks and tell him what's what. It's a true story, though. I am going to call him. Yes. 
Manual D gives us guidance, max velocity in the supply, and that's going to be 900 feet per minute. 700 feet per minute, 900 feet per minute. Branch runs, uh, I like six to 700 feet per minute. I can get the proper amount of throw. I don't think I'm going to get into much manual T stuff, but there's as much importance in grill selection or supply grill selection to the point where if we're not looking at throw and terminal velocity and all that kind of stuff, we're hitting the tall guy in the head with the air and he's complaining and he's not you know, going to have us come back to do any more work. So it's just not aesthetics. You know, it's just not those, the Hart & Cooley 411s, the brown or off-white floor registers, if you're running them at six or 700 feet per minute, they got six and a half feet of throw. How many houses are you working in that have six and a half foot ceilings? Right? There's only so many people that are you know, shorter than me that live in them houses that walk around like this. Right? You got to hit the, if, for air conditioning, we got to hit the ceilings, right? You, you need eight feet of throw. So you got to be designing at velocities that include that. And that's one of those little snippets in this class that if you're right with me on what I just said, you're probably already designing pretty good duct systems. If you're going, well, we, we pick them by how they look. You can make significant improvements. And 80% of our industry is. That's one thing I definitely want to make clear. If I'm saying stuff that you're like, ooh, I'm not doing that. Nobody else is either. So don't beat yourself up about it, but make some corrections. Yes. The comment was with placement of the return static tip, we're measuring external static pressure. I don't use the, the word total in front of it because I can't find a legitimate source that uses it other than Bergman. And we went through some stuff with some stuff that recently got published. I don't know where total comes from. I just say external static pressure. It's, it's not wrong, but it's just the way it's expressed. Hey, go ahead. It's the same thing. It's in our definitions. I'm not going to answer you because I'm going to go step by step at the end after we do our design and measure it. All right? We got to get back to our topic. It was almost like I did that on purpose, right? That was pretty good. <laughs> All right, never start on high speed. When you're doing a design, in case I don't say this six times, I'm going to do my best to, to do it six times, don't start on high speed. When we look at our blower tables, start on something other than high speed. You guys are paying attention. Medium speed or lower or a tap if you're using a constant torque ECM. And by the way, everything that we're talking about today basically addresses a PSC motor or a constant torque ECM. If you're putting it in the constant airflow, eh, just put 0.3 for your available static pressure and don't exceed the velocities. You can do essentially whatever you want. That's kind of tongue in cheek, but it's kind of true too. Don't start off in high speed. We're going to populate that number. We look at our chart. Our chart tells us for 1,000 CFM, we're going to do a little interpolation. Between 0.7 and 0.8 lies 1,000 CFM. Everybody cool with that? So we have 0.75 is where we're starting. It's not 0.5, just to be clear. It's 0.75. You're going to put an air conditioning system in your design? I am. That one right there, E29A, I went with the E29A in lieu of B or C, because I, I have height restrictions. What's my pressure drop? When it's wet, right there, it's 0.2. Nothing difficult about that. Agreed? Right? How to read a chart? Boom. 0.2 is populated. There's the coil that we used. Next in line, electric resistance heat. <clears throat> Do we have that in our fossil fuel furnace? No. Do we have a hot water coil? Nope. Do we have a heat exchanger? Yes, in fact, in that furnace that I showed, we have two. Those pressure drops are included in our blower table, right? Already taken into account. It's probably been, oh, I don't know, 68 or 69 years since 
heat exchangers were separate. But I think that really is left in there because it can count as other. Right? There's, there's no other in there. Yep. So, these come into play in other designs, not in the design that we're currently doing. Filters are next. This is my favorite slide because it shows her or him. I don't know which it is. I love that. When I become king someday, I will require every filter manufacturer to publish that right on the filter. No looking it up, no math. They're telling us that if I'm moving 1,000 CFM, I'm going to have a 0.21 drop. So I'm going to do one of two things. I'm going to make sure I have enough fan to overcome that pressure drop. If I don't have enough fan to overcome the pressure drop, I'm going to put two of them in. And it's going to equal something closer to 0.08 or 0.09. When I say two filters, no. <laughs> yes. All right, everybody's with me on that. I'm sorry? I stole it from somebody's uh, thing on the internet. Eric, what's his last name? That's, I stole that picture from him. Or I stole that picture from Steve, because Steve had the same picture, and Steve brags about that company. I'm talking about uh, Captain America out there. He, he brags that, that it, they're a really smart company because they're from uh, Minneapolis that make that. It's three, a 3M product. What? And that's what, I believe that's where that picture came from. It, it, realistically, that's the way it works out. So we're going to have airflow in excess of that or around that, and who would purposely put a filter with a 0.45 drop in it? Now, I could start off with, you know, over an inch up here and be very, very strict about keeping these numbers down and make it work. But that's not how it works. Somebody started off with a three-ton drive in their furnace on a three-ton AC, and they end up with no available static pressure, which means they're going to run a real external static pressure of 0.7 or 0.8, which is well out of the desired airflow. It kind of goes back to, and I'm not going to spend any more time than just this quick thought, because if I don't get it out, uh, I'll keep thinking about it and I can't speak. But a big external static pressure is not bad. It's relative. So you can have a big number and things are good. You can have a small number and things are bad. You have to take a static pressure reading and compare it to something that makes a difference, right? So, I love this. I, no other way to put it. That we just made it easy. This is hard. You have to interpret and decipher and all that, and it's why people just, eh, I'm just going to put any filter in. But at 1,000 CFM, this particular filter has a 0.19 drop. Nothing wrong with that, but i got to make sure I have enough oomph or pressure to overcome that drop. Next, we got the UV light, because everybody likes putting them in. Are you taking them into account as pressure drops? I watched John, I'm forgetting his last name, Ellis, and he didn't put one in. I think he put nine in. Buy eight, get one free. There's a good strategy, right? It creates a pressure drop. And if you want to do that, do it. Make sure you got enough fan to make it happen. Then we get into a supply outlet. And what we see here is a standard number that is populated very frequently on the friction rate worksheet. You see 0 0.03, 0 0.03, and 0 0.03. A supply covering, a return covering, and a branch damper. That's the guidance in Manual D. And there is one of them. The idea behind Manual D is to calculate what is referred to as the critical path. The critical path is the longest circulation path that takes place in the system. We find the problem run. It has the longest TEL. If we can supply the critical path with the proper volume at an acceptable velocity, then we can do the rest of them. 
Worst thing that's going to happen is the air is going to take the path of least resistance. We're going to have some guys that are like me on a Saturday, right? Yep. Trying to get away with not path of least resistance, and we just block them off, and it ends up being what they refer to as equal friction. So everybody's getting the same, uh, or the design air by slowing down the ones that have an easier path. That's all. And the whole friction rate thing is per 100 feet. Essentially what you're doing is calculating the pressure drop per 100 feet. Whether your duct system is two or three or four or five or where's the house? 750 feet long, right? We're, we're breaking it down into our pressure drop or friction per 100 feet. So we know we have enough oomph to deliver the proper volume at an acceptable velocity to each supply outlet. That last 90 seconds was the heaviest that we're going to do for the rest of the day. If you want a friction rate worksheet or you want to do it on a computer, this is free from ACCA. You can download the speed sheet. And you have to fill everything in because if you don't, it curses at you. It's a bunch of hashtags and exclamation points like the cartoons. So that's how they would curse. That's what it does if you don't fill it out right. I do it like that, all right? No computers. I draw it on my little dry erase board. It's the way I do things. All right. Uh, back on track to specifically what we're talking about. And that's filling out the friction rate worksheet. One grill, one register, because they're in our critical path. We got to add that guy. So we got 0 .03, 0 .03, and 0 .03. When I'm doing a duct design, I just write 0 .1 and take care of all of them. Don't even bother. Do you think, and I am going to back up, do you think that guy right there has a 0.03 drop? That Hart and Cooley 411 has a bigger drop than this at five or 600 feet per minute. The Royal Air 531 doesn't see a pressure drop that high until you're almost pushing 1,000 feet per minute. That guy right there at uh, six or 700 feet per minute is half of that 0.03. So that's why I'll take another one. Thank you very much. Oh, I'll take both of them. Woo, souvenirs from Florida, baby. I don't get out much, so when I get to take stuff home, I, I take it home. <laughs> so they're all populated. And that guy's populated, so we're golden. We're going to add them up. You don't need a calculator, but that's just my segue into the next slide. Everything's populated. We add them up. We come up with 0.54. They are our total component losses. Our available static pressure is equal to our external static pressure less our device losses. And I get to slip that device in there because that's what the old sheet says. Do a little bit of math. Our available static pressure is 0.21. Did we do anything difficult yet? Have you been forced to do something so far? Yeah, it's the path, right? First couple times you do it, right? you know, that plate, plate might meet wall. We talked about the keys on the floor. Hopefully not, but sometimes, you know. Vent that frustration if you need to. All right, I got 0.75 minus 0.54 gives me that 0.21. So that part of my task has been completed. We can use the friction rate worksheet, and at the bottom of it, it has a friction chart to solve for our friction rate, or we can do it with math. Before we can use this chart or this chart, we have to finish step four. If I asked you what the effective length, and this is for my heating guys in the north more so than in the, the south. If a plastic chimney for a furnace, in the instructions they said that my elbows are worth five feet because the effective length, the amount of pressure drop for an elbow is the equivalent of, right? All of it, right? Our effective length, it's, it's the pressure drop is the equivalent of going through five feet of straight duct. So if I have three elbows and 15 feet of pipe, I would have 30 feet in TEL. You're better at that than knowing what a pound of air weighs. I'll give you that. So, <laughs> see, I get stuck on something like that, man, and I just don't let it go. I'm that little yappy I'm dog. All right, I'm going to give you an opportunity to redeem yourself. Oh, 
what does a gallon of water weigh? Say 8.3, 8.3. 8.3, nailed it, baby. So we have to solve for step four, which is figuring out our effective length for everything in our critical path on the supply and the return. It's 220 and 110. All right, step five. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, Ed. Slow down, Ed. Oh, I guess I didn't get all my notes out of my slides. This is me telling what, myself what to do next. <laughs> recognize that? If you don't recognize that, how can you do a proper duct design? Right? This is the thing that gives us guidance. It helps us. It tells us to go through append, uh, yeah, Appendix 3 and all the groups of fittings, figure out the effective length for everything that could potentially be our critical path. And they give you four tries. After you do this ten times, you need to do it once because it's obvious which is the, the offender, so to speak. So we're going to populate this and maybe this. And I am, in this example, going to populate those two lines. I'm also going to do a return. This house happens to have... Taking a picture. I got to pause. Single point return, so I don't have to figure out which one is the longest effective length that has an effective length. You want to do it on a computer? You want it, uh, what's the word? I want to say computerized, but I just said computer. Uh, automatic, digital, yeah. So it's there. These are the effective length charts. They're all in these red tabs, or they're in the book, right? So if you don't buy the book, you still should buy the book, but you can get access to all this information in the red tabs. Halfway? I'm, I'm in big trouble. I lied. I'm in excellent shape. Uh, well, maybe on this, not with this, but... I was 118 pounds at the beginning of COVID, man. It's, it's been, a, <laughs> been a rough paddle, man. <laughs> oh, that was a great way to bring that full circle, man. Oh. All right. If you've never seen these charts, this is a, an eye into what the effective length charts look like. We're going to take every fitting we're going to take everything that is in that critical path and give it an effective length. Then some of it are going to have actual lengths. and We're going to add them together, and we're going to figure out which circulation path. And to be honest with you, I just learned that, that phrase, longest circulation path, within the last two weeks. So if it seems like I'm using it a lot, I'm getting as much mileage out of something I just learned as I can. So that longest circulation path, I had to say it again, we want to figure out which one of these duck runs is it. So I have to go through the whole thing. This is easy, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy, this is easy. This is friggin' hard, right? This is one of the hardest things we're going to talk about today, and I don't think we're going to get into detail, so I might just skip it. No, I'll explain it. Where, what type of fitting you use as a takeoff and where it is in relation to the end cap or a reducer and how many downstream has an effect on its effective length. If nobody lives downstream, it doesn't have that long of an effective length. If it has five or more downstream from it, it has a significantly longer effective length. And that's as much time as I can devote to that because I spent too much time talking about my kid. I got no regrets. <laughs> my tattoo is spelt wrong where it says it. I regret that, but other than that, that's my favorite tattoo, no regrets, and it's like in a bad font, and it doesn't match, and it's crooked. I got a lot of respect for that person. Our trunk length, it's 20 feet plus 12 feet plus a group one fitting of 35 feet and 80 feet gives me a TEL of 227. This is what makes me me, because when you look at this, it doesn't mean squat to you, does it? But if you can picture that this 35 feet is this right here. This 12 foot of trunk is my branch run. That actually should be there now that I looked. It's because it's a run out, not a trunk, but 
Eh, I'm going to blame it on a typo. 80 feet for group four. That termination, right, that's worth 80 feet. Whenever you go from vertical to horizontal or horizontal to vertical, it's going to be worth at least 60 or 70 feet or more. That inside radius is key. The square throat is, again, that's a, a, a punch to the gut. It has a longer effective length. If I just went straight up with this and didn't have that nice little angle, if my duck is large compared to my plenum, you're looking at over 100 feet in effective length. But if I do that throat where there's not as much turbulence, also known as eddy currents, named after me, right? There, if you have the radius throat, you don't get as much turbulence. The effective length isn't nearly as severe. I am never giving you my slides to preview ever again. It's the next slide. No, it, it's not, but it makes a world of difference. So it's not 80 feet? Depending on your height to width ratio and how many veins and the size, you could take 80 and turn it into 5. Yep. yep, just follow the math. These are all the pages that we find, and follow the process. That's the way we do it. We populated both of these and we saw that this one has a shorter effective length. This one has a longer effective length. And again, you're looking at numbers on the board. You're going, I'm getting ready to leave, Ed. All right. You recognize that, right? There's our furnace. There's our trunk. If I go 35 feet for this fitting, you saw it had the 45 on it. I only went three feet till I got to my first takeoff. My takeoff was worth 65 feet. I'm doing this from memory. I don't know. Uh, it was worth 55 feet. I had an elbow that was worth 30 feet because of the shape. My termination box was worth 80. So to go from the furnace just to here was worth 220 feet in total effective length. To go further away, I had a much longer trunk, but because... This guy doesn't have any branch runs downstream. This one has four or five until I get to a trunk reducer. This takeoff was worth 55 feet, where this one was worth 35, and that's the difference between even this, though this guy is physically further away, this closer one had a longer TEL. And I don't have the time to, because he's got that look like, oh, my God, not again, on his face. So we're just going to power through it. Trust me, it's how it works. My return is rather short in TEL. Uh, I was under the impression that air coming back to the fan was different than going away, and that was one of those myths that I perpetuated for a long time. But I think it's just that the fittings we traditionally use on returns are more friendly, so I'm going to stick with that. Our effective length, our total effective length for our return was 63 feet. And we populate the 220 and the 63. It gives us 283 for our TEL. We have the two numbers that we need now, don't we? 0.21 from up here, just short of 300 feet right there. And it has us falling between 0.08 and 0.06. Didn't come out of 0.1, did it? You can buy duculators that say, size it at point, uh, point 0.1. And is that correct? No. Calculate it. We know we have enough oomph because we, we have 0.2 or greater for our available static pressure. And everything else is going to come out the way it's supposed to. And if you prefer to do math instead of the chart, 0.21 times 100 uh, divided by the TEL of 283 gives me a friction of 0.074. If you want to round that to 0.08, knock yourself out. You want to round it down to 0.07, I'm equally as accepting. It's not going to make of enough of a difference on the duck slide. So whichever one you like better, do it. 0.07, boom, we have our friction rate. And it's a calculated value. In a harsh environment, run your velocities in the red at the max. In a conditioned space, 
run them at the conservative numbers. It, it ends up being a better system. You can have the whole slide deck, but if you want to take a picture, hurry up while I enjoy this refreshing beverage. Come on, man, hurry up. And that goes out to uh, figure out a way to get a hold of me. Uh, I'll make sure that anybody wants copies of these. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a link to my, my Dropbox. Maybe I'll put some other goodies in there, too. I'll be at the TEC booth tomorrow, too, if you want to come talk. There's our, our duck slide. 1,000 CFM, and I just used round because we use metal in my market, and it's usually a rectangle. And they use flex down here, and it's round, so I found a happy medium between the two. So <laughs> that made sense, right? I have a, a 0.07 friction at 1,000. I line my 1,000 underneath a, a 0.07 friction. You guys know how to do this part already, right? Yeah. It's figuring out your friction rate is the, the part. So I came out with 15-inch rounds. I don't have access to 15-inch rounds. So I take my duck slide and I line it up with the next size and I can see that that 16 inch duct at 1000 CFM is going to have a velocity between 7 and 800 feet per minute. That's wonderful for a supply, it is no good for a return because I'm at my max velocity. So what I have to do is move the ductulator a little bit, remember return, 700 feet per minute is max and that right there is over 700. Just by a little, but it's enough that that's going to give me agena. So I am going to spin my, my ductulator up to the next size duct. Right, because again, I, I, well, I got to get it at 1,000 CFM and 700 feet per minute. I'm lined up. I am over the 16 inch line, so I got to round up. And there it is, I zoomed in on it so you can see. And I can't get 17 inch round, so I'm going with 18. Depending on the duct configuration and at your discretion, might I leave it 16 inch? If it's in an attic, I might. And I'm going to roll the dice that it's not going to make noise. If it's somewhere else in the house, it's a no brainer. I'm going up to the next size. If I have a. Uh, return that consists of a couple of turns, I might be apt to roll the dice on that one. If I'm in the conditioned space, uh, I'm next size up. 600 feet per minute is the conservative velocity guidance, so when I go up to 18, my 1,600 are two peas in a pod. I like that. Branch runs. And I have seen duct systems that look like this that work just fine. If you're only trying to get 9 to 10 CFM per branch run, you're golden. <laughs> Who's to say that's not right? It could be a low load home. When we size branch runs, if you're not sizing branch runs based off of a heating or a cooling factor, you're using that MSU stuff, not Montclair State University. You're making stuff up, right? This is how it works. You can use the, the fancy charts and let it do the math for you, or you can do the math yourself. Essentially what we're solving for is how many BTUs per CFM or CFM per BTUs. I don't remember which one it is and I don't care at this point. It's actually, uh, I'm dividing my CFM by my BTUs and then I'll take how many BTUs I need and that will tell me how many CFM I need. That's how you figure out your branch runs. The problem with the rules of thumb is people use total BTUs to determine CFM. If you're doing latent work with your runouts, where's the water going? <laughs> Some place you don't want to. So it's all a sensible exchange that's taking place. We completed our duct system, and that's me. It's a little dark there, but that's me. I have a completed duct system here. I stole that on the internet from somewhere. That looks pretty good, so I like the way that one looked. So we have our completed duct system. This is where we wanted to get. How do we know if we did any good or not? Well, we can judge ourselves. <clears throat> Remember this friction? Yeah, we're going to check the static. Remember the friction rate worksheet that we filled out? Let's look at the specific numbers we care about. 
We started off in our design with 0.75 for our external static pressure. Well, why don't we measure it? Our pressure drop across the wet coil was 0.2. Let's see how we did. How about our delta P across the filter? Again, we can grade our installation. So we get our DG8, which everybody wants, right? Two lucky people are going to get one of them tomorrow. That's pretty cool. So my design was 0.75. <clears throat> I'm going to hurt my arm if I get a reading like that, right? Pat myself on the back. That's exactly what we're trying to achieve, right? Sometimes we come up with numbers that are way off, and we're going to address that in just a little bit. What if we were to measure something like this? This is an indication that our duct system doesn't have as much resistance as we calculated. So we slow the fan down. That's all we do and get it to the airflow that we want it to. Again, we're high-fiving maybe just ourselves, but we should be proud of ourselves right there. So why don't you stop putting your duct work in dumb locations there, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. The, the comment was if you make the air go through too slow through the duct, it could be potential condensation issues. So sharpen your pencil when you're doing your duct design. If that's your reality, that's what you got to do. <laughs> Me too. We share that. How about if we measure the pressure drop across our coil and it comes out at 50 pascals? That's, Bergman told us, that's 50 knot farts instead of one, right? 50. Which, there's 25 pascals in a tenth of an inch water column. We just nailed the 0.2 pressure drop. Again, we should go buy ourselves several beers. Pressure drop across our filter. What was it on the friction rate worksheet? 0.2. Right? If I measured 0.012, I'm going to triple or quadruple my MERV and treat myself to a higher MERV filter. That ain't going to happen. I exaggerated that number. That was just an easy number to find on a Google search, but that's a whole other topic. I had a guy, anybody go on the HVAC school uh, Facebook uh, group? You look at that, right? This was uh, Trevor is his name. And he was in my inbox every day, asking questions, asking questions, asking questions. And I always answer questions with questions. He was asking duct design questions. He designed at 0.3. He got finished that job that day, and it came out at 0.28. His arm should hurt from patting himself on the back because he nailed it, right? Customer was happy, blah, blah, blah. Good stuff. All right, I have no idea what's coming next. Oh. You don't want to use external static pressure. You want a better mousetrap. You want to go back in time a, a few years. Drill a hole in your supply trunk. Measure your normal operating static pressure. Take your filter out. Stick the legacy true flow in the slot. Measure your airflow. It is that easy. Right? Big price tag with that combo. But wait, there's more. What are we going to do? We're going to go listen to Steve or hang out with Steve and let him show you how the, the digital true flow works. Same process. Take a static pressure reading in the supply. Take the filter out. Stick the digital true flow in, in place of it. And it's going to tell you your airflow. It also has guidance in there that will tell you to take a pressure measurement here, 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 and here. And it will populate all this. It will tell you your CFM per ton. It'll tell you your coil pressure drop. It'll tell you your filter pressure drop. And it'll give you a, a grading system, if you will, with your supply and return static. My thing, you give it to the salesman. When the salesman calls the customer, he asks them what size filter they have. And he's going to give them a free filter. It has nothing to do with the free filter. He walks into the house with the digital true flow ready to take a measurement. And inside two minutes, he measures the airflow. And that guides the whole, what are we going to put in your house process? And he just smoked all the other competition. Look at this space age stuff that he's got going on. Those guys want eight grand more, but I want to go with them. 
Uh-oh, but my credit score sucks. I don't know how we're going to fix that, but we, we, got, we got to do it. I got 98 left. I thought it was 19. I got 98, and I'm making everything up. I, I'm, I'm fine. Equivalent length, right? When we look at the equivalent lengths of our ducts, they are based on specific parameters in the tables in Manual D. Who ends up with the external static pressures that are a lot lower than you typically anticipate? I know you do, Mike. Anybody else? Do you, do you end up with lower numbers? Okay, because you live in flex land, because I know you're full of crap, right? But if, if you live in a market where you use a lot of hard ducts, it's a lot easier to come out with external static pressures that are lower than anticipated. If you're doing the flexes like Camerata or Camerato or Neil, then that's different. But if you can, but and we're going to go through it specifically, right? There's a lot of truth to that, but there's also some misconceptions. It can, and we're going to go through some specifics with regard to this. So let's delve into why we have some of these potential issues. When you look at these charts, this is a supply, this is a return. These effective lengths that we're getting, and these are the big numbers. This is that bullhead T, big, uh, big duck compared to the, the plenum. Height to width ratio is 0.5. That means that my duct height, it's by eight duct work. I have a smaller coil, so front to back on the coil, 16 inches. That's a 0.5 height to width ratio. That fitting right there has an effective length of 120 feet. Is it wrong? No. Is this a better fitting? Yes, because it has an effective length, I think, of 30 or 35, accomplishing the same thing, going from vertical to horizontal. <clears throat> Let me finish. These 120 and this 35 feet is with reference to a velocity of 900 feet per minute and a friction of 0.08. Are you always going to design at the ceiling of your velocity and a 0.08 friction? And the answer is no. And we're going to do some math because I learned how to do the math to actually do this where we're going to compare it to a chart. After this guy asks me another question, so what do you got? Two words, two words, system effect. Are you familiar with what system effect is? What they're trying to do is avoid system effect. When, and the question was you should have some straight duct before you make a turn when you come out of a blower. And the reason behind that is you have a thing that's called system effect. When air comes out of a forward inclined fan, it is in a very sp uh, particular pattern. And if you were to look at that air tumbling, you, you literally have voids. It's, it's bizarre. On a supply side, you can put insert a pitot tube and see negative pressures, which the first time you see it, you start taking your meter and it ain't working, man, except for it's got that red liquid and it just splashed all over you when you did that. Best case scenario, they want to make sure that you're moving those 4,000 CFM down the duct, but when you have the system effect gets interrupted by an abrupt turn or you take an... Uh, Takeoff off of it, you're not going to get what is predictable. Right, but you're also messing up the whole pressurization of the duct system. And here's a real easy way to answer that. When you follow the rules, you get predictable results. If you do something else, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. So it all goes back to it, the laws of physics are what they are. Again, predictable results come with following the rules. So you, 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 man, you drive with no seat belt, your, your left wheel right on the line. You just don't care, do you? Right? No, scissors. You, you take those scissors and you run across that living room and sit right in front of that TV like that, don't you? I know. I'm on to you, man. I'm on to you. So when it comes to using the effective length charts, we have to remember that these charts are those, they represent effective lengths that are going to be with reference to a specific set of conditions. 
So if you want to see me show off my math, what I'm doing is the actual calculation to when we do something different. If we're running a slower velocity, and that's what this is showing over here, if I'm running at 700 feet per minute on this fitting, when I correct it for the, uh, what, I, what did I change here? I drop my velocity from 700 feet per minute, so that tells me this is for a return fitting. This return fitting started off with an effective length of 20 feet. When I dropped my velocity from 700 down to 500, it corrected it to a effective length of 10 feet. So I literally dropped my effective length by half just by slowing the air down by 200 feet per minute. It's a significant number. And I don't know if anybody was here last year. There was some pretty cool stuff going on where somebody was questioning what somebody else said. And I don't know who was right, and I don't want to find out. But I know I'm right, damn it, because there's math right there. <laughs> this surprised me. Friction goes up, effective length goes down. I did that formula four times and called, what's the, on that game show, you phone a friend or whatever? Yeah. I immediately got on the phone and said, am I doing this right? And they're like, yeah, you didn't know that? And I'm like, no. And then they called me a dumbass and then they laughed. They didn't know it either. They were just making fun of me. So, uh, I, That's probably it. And I, I have feelings too, you know. You can't make fun of me. So. Again, if you want to look at this stuff up close, uh, I'll get you a copy of this. And that's the math. And you can do the math. Or there's a chart in the back of Manual D in the appendixes that nobody reads. And it shows. You see all these single-digit numbers. And does anybody purposely on a residential system doing anything that has a friction of 0.14? Do you? Do you? A f not an uh, available static pressure, a friction rate of 0.14. Do you? Okay. Because most of the time when I end up having fr uh, friction rates that go over 0.11, you end up with velocities that exceed the velocity limits and you make your ductwork bigger. So it's you're doing the the process twice, I always try and get my available static pressure to come out somewhere around 0.2 or 0.3. With a friction of 0.14, that's usually an available static pressure of 0.3 or 0.4, which you, you start to get to the edge of that, that one, it's called the wedge, and the guidance there is to slow the fan down or less available static pressure. And I just said a whole bunch of stuff that you're going, Blah, 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 move on, Ed. So I'm going to move on. If you are using these defaults of 0 0.03, 0 0.03, 0 0.03, which I generally do, that is going to be another example of why you're coming out with external static pressures that are lower than your design. So if you put in real numbers for these, and sometimes real numbers mean that you didn't put a damper in, so don't take credit for it, if you're using good grills, and when I say good, you're generally actually selecting grills based off of their throw and terminal velocity, then you end up with this number being half of it. So instead of coming out with a 0.3 of available static pressure, you're backing it down to 0.25. So these are all numbers. It's, it's conservative stuff. Even in the north, we use flex. And that's what brings the pain when it comes to these external static pressures. Because when we have external static pressures that are higher than we anticipate, it usually goes right back to flex. And the easiest way to explain that is, even if you're using a duct slide that was made for flex, unless it says otherwise, it's for 0 to 4% compression. That's cam a Camarado kind of compression. Yes, sir? Do you know if the softwares are required to size the equivalent length of the fitting according to 0 0.08 and 900, or if, they, or if they're required to calculate according to your, your frictional rate that you so, so, you Well, know. I know what you're asking. The question is, do the softwares do this math for us automatically? If I'm paying more than 50 cents for it, it's freaking better. And I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm going to assume it does 
because I've seen the guys that are good with the, the programs move stuff, and that's why the duck sizes change. So I'm assuming it does. And, that's, and I want to point out that it's an assumption on my part, and if somebody knows, uh, we can find out. I believe it does, because the idea behind those programs being a better mousetrap is they do those things for you. And this is not a derogatory statement towards any software program, but be leery of garbage in, garbage out. When you populate the software programs, make sure that you populate them with the fittings that you're actually going to use. I have stood in way too many basements or houses where the contractor said, well, I didn't design the ductwork, the software did. Those libraries, the ones that I'm familiar with, and I'm not speaking about any specific brand, but the ones I'm familiar with auto-populate with fittings that have shorter effective lengths because it just makes sense that you would always use those fittings. Software programs. If I go back to my DOS-based days and in the early Windows programs, they did not auto-populate. You had to go in and hit a button to populate them. Those programs did not start spitting out an answer until you were three quarters of the way through the process. We live in an instant gratification society. If it's not telling me how many BTUs after I draw the first box of a, of a room, people are losing interest. So in order to keep people interested in the, the process, they start to accumulate a number and people will say, all right, I put nine minutes into it, wherever it is, I'm good. And then they double it and that's what they install. So there, there's some definite issues with that. But the final results is if you do things the way you're supposed to, in comparison to the speed sheet or a piece of paper, you should be able to do the whole load calc equipment selection and duct design, you know, in a quarter of the time. So that was a good question, a lot better than what these guys have been answered, asking, so thank you. Uh, I don't believe so, because if that was the case, every one of Genry's systems wouldn't work because they don't have returns. There's another thing, and that's a good question. The question originally, can a return drop be too big? Uh, unless somebody can correct me, I don't see why not. When the external static pressure charts or the fan tables are created in the factory, there's nothing connected to the return of a furnace or an air handler. So, yeah, I don't see where it could be a problem. I had somebody say something on one of the Facebook groups telling me that the picture of the system in my house was an incorrect or it wouldn't read a good reading because it was too big, which, okay. You know, I, every time you write something, I tell you your number one to the screen, but you know, I was hoping he was going to be here and I'd be like, was that you? you know, I know it wasn't you. I don't actually know what the guy looks like. I think he has a cartoon yeah, face or something. Yeah? And, and wearing a camo hat with sunglasses on it? <laughs> no, I know who Doug is. He's the guy from that Geico, or no, what's the other commercial? The Yellow Insurance Company. Oh. And Doug. Right. My, wife, my wife works for um, Emu. Yeah, and Doug. My wife can't, and whenever that commercial, I go, and Doug. Because my wife works for Selective, and their marketing is garbage, right? They, all these other, they have these cool commercials. Their slogan is uniquely insured. What? So I make fun of her about that all the time. It's pretty good. I'm glad that these things are going to be recording, uh, recorded because I'm going to have at least like six solid minutes of content when I get home. Did you know this, this, this is for the camera? No, this trip, this whole conference lasts. Did you know that it's two more weeks of this? I'm not going to be home until like, what, the end of March? <laughs> Yeah, that's it. No, I'll go buy. If I could stay for two weeks, I'll go buy a set. Right? I'm not. I'm not sleeping in that room with Michael Jackson looking at me. Though, right? <laughs> they rented a creepy place, man. I'm telling you, it was creepy. Oh, hee <laughs> hee! Is that pretty good? I'm not even gonna try. I can't do that. <laughs> All right, let's get back. I need that face with the, uh, let's get back to the topic. He told me 15 minutes when I had an hour, right? So now I got to drag it out. I'm kidding. 
How much do I got? 34. 34. Mr. 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 Precise over here, right? How many seconds? Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to why do our external static pressures come out higher than we anticipate, and I blame flex every time. I'm going to guess at least half of the people in this room have read the instruction, instructions when it comes to installing flex. If you have somebody who's somewhat familiar with our industry, and you pulled into the front yard of your house, and saw two guys properly installing flex, you'd be on the phone calling their boss telling them, what are you guys doing? Yeah, you guys know what I'm talking about? You're supposed to take the flex and play tug of war for 20 pounds of pressure for 60 seconds. Yeah. You pull up and see two guys doing that. Like, what are you doing? Well, you told us we couldn't wrestle anymore, so we came up with a, you know, a new plan. It is amazing. If you do it, and then you let it go, it's hmm Imagine that, you follow the directions and something good happens. <clears throat> so I blew it up so you can see it. We got uh, 0.04, 0 0.04, where the hell did that come from? We have 0 to 4% compression, that's the default in Manual D, and Manual D does have more language that addresses the compression. Uh, I don't know if I've ever read it, because I have uh, what I'm going to call a better mousetrap. I... It's not that I don't like this duck slide. I've done uh, more than a couple complete duck layouts and realized I was using the wrong box. So if I'm doing flex, I have a duck slide that is for flex. If I'm doing metal, I have a duck slide that is for metal because I have the attention span of a gnat and I use it incorrectly. It's not a fault of the actual um, duck slide. It's my fault, so I make sure that I don't have that issue. This is a pretty cool duck slide. And it not only gives us sizing for metal, it gives us sizing for flex at 4%, 15 and 30% compression. So the way that works out is, in this example, I calculated a 0.07 friction rate, which that's actually the number that we used in this example. I don't know if that was happenstance or I made these slides for this. It doesn't matter, it's the way it worked out. So at a 0.07 friction rate, I'm lined up right here with 110 CFM because that's what was required for whatever I was doing. I come over here and see that metal duct. I'm going to have to round up to 7 inch to get my 110 CFM at that friction rate. If I look at 4% compression with flex, that's flex pulled tight or pretty darn close. I'm going to need 8 inch flex for a 110 CFM volume. Over here, I'm at 15% compression. All right, we got 10 feet of flex. I have an 8.5 foot span. I have a 10 foot piece of flex that's coming out of the side of a trunk. It's making a 90 degree radius bend. That 90 degree bend, that radius, is no less than the diameter of the flex. So I'm going eight and a half feet in physical length with 10 feet of flex. That's going to equal that 15% compression. I need 9-inch flex. In this example, I'm coming out of the side of the trunk. I zig, I zag. I make a 90 into a 8 by 8 or whatever size ceiling box. I have 30% compression. That is a 7-foot span with 10 feet of flex. I need 10-inch flex to move 110 CFM. Everybody raise your hand who has ever installed 10-inch flex for 110 CFM. Right? Nobody. So in reality, what happened? They, they took a 6-inch box of flex, they cut both ends and stuck it out this way, and you got 41 CFM if you're lucky coming out of the intentional hole in that duct system in the ceiling in the whatever room. So in reality, what do we get? We design a system for 1,000. We use the MSU method and we're really moving 680 CFM. 200 CFM is leaking to the attic. We got maybe 400 CFM making it to the conditioned space. When the new company comes out and they say the old unit doesn't cool well enough, the new company, another ton or another half a ton and we're golden. And is that reality? Yeah. If you don't measure, you don't know. You start to measure, you find out all kinds of really good stuff. 
But this right here, there's nothing wrong with using flex in that manner if you do the math for it. But people don't do the math for it, so ultimately we end up with something less. Uh, David Richardson was talking about stuff earlier today, and I missed his thing. I'll watch it next week at my leisure. But their organization or their entity or uh, CI, NCI. I know a guy that did some stuff for him. He had 16,000 data points. A lot of information. Average air, airflow during when this information, these data points were collected, 298 per ton. That was the average airflow across an evaporator coil measured. And I think that was predominantly using external static pressure, which is a pretty good estimate of airflow. So when you start looking at numbers like that, you know, that's, that's not good. What's that? So what happens if you uh, work off a bill, square it up? You got to quit asking commercial questions in a residential class, but finish. Okay. <laughs> uh, square it up or ran off cap and the last five feet flex down to a high velocity grip. So would you use the flex choice? I wouldn't put that in my house. I know. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out which chart should I use. Should I use metal or should I use flex? The question is, putting in commercial, you're running metal pipe off of a trunk and then using the flex for the last couple feet. That's, that's the, it's, you might as well have a high velocity system in a residential application, because Manual D is talking about residential duct design. So it's like the sound attenuator, am I saying that right? On the high velocity systems, it's the same idea. Yeah, put the flex on, size it right. But, but what chart you use? Flex chart? I don't know. Are you doing design build? Because if you're doing design build, you shouldn't be asking me that question. If you're just doing build, follow the design. Yeah. <laughs> Let somebody with a P after their name take the fall. I ain't taking it. Okay. But that last five feet, you should be able to stretch. Yeah. I figured that, but I thought, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> we just found out that he's the guy that's asking the high-level questions to show all you guys what he knows. I got to remind you. He didn't know what a pound of water weighed. <laughs> so when you do all of these effective length, uh, use the effective length charts. If we're coming out with external static pressures that are higher than anticipated, most likely you have velocities that are higher than anticipated. That's the way it works out. We can always track down where the problem is. And one of the things that I have found over the years, even if you do sort of a, a half-assed job size in your ductwork, it's pretty forgiving. You got to do some pretty horrific stuff, right? Like not follow the plans and size that last five feet of flex right. I'm kidding. Uh, it's got to be the last six feet. No. You got to do stuff really wrong, but it's amazing the lengths that people will go to to do stuff that's really wrong. And what's even scarier is we have people that are under the impression what they're doing actually makes sense. The idea of using all six inch flexes and making all the flexes the same length, there is this weird perception that that's gonna be a self-balancing system. And again, after they get done explaining that, I have to slowly get up off my knees and stand up all the way because I'm laughing so hard that I was on the ground. It's the same, Joel isn't in here, is he? Because he was a uh, witness to it last night. We were at getting out of the back of his van, and Steve Rogers pushed me, and I did a belly flop. I got like six or seven steps before I actually went down. I almost saved it. Boom. He really didn't push me. I tripped, but the story's better if I say somebody pushed me. And I, I, I didn't even have a beer yet, and I was falling flat on my face. I kind of bounce now. I didn't break a hip, so we share that. I, should, I, I can do a good belly flop, man. <laughs> All right, we got more time, right? We got 20 minutes? Okay, because I was going to tell you to, you know, can you decipher that? You got to read it backwards. No. Anybody? Read it backwards. Leave now. But no, we got time for bonus material because... I rushed through all my stuff before. Now I'm going to keep saying that because I'm just busting on you. It's fine, right? Yeah.
this is one of my, well, the, this is the, the conclusion to Manual D. And I'm thinking that you guys have seen this a bunch, or maybe you haven't. This is a big deal. We're taking the whole, putting the ductwork in an aggressive environment. That's another way to say putting it in a hot attic. I got these catchphrases, baby. You got some words, huh? I do. <laughs> Most of them are, you know, made up, and it sounds good. I don't know if it's right or not, but it sounds good. There are scores of things to worry about when designing and installing a comfort system. Low velocity through a duct airway is not one of them. The only time that that really becomes an issue is, again, when we're running ducts through an unconditioned space. But if you look at what's taking place here, and what's taking place here is a duct diameter 6, 8, 10, or 12, our velocity is dropping substantially as we go through those ducts, but we size our distribution box based off of our grill size. We base our grill size and style after its location and its throw. We want to pick a grill that has the proper throw. And for a very simplistic explanation, and I actually have something I can draw on, That's a room. That's 12 feet. That's 2 feet. That's my supply outlet that has a piece of flex that's pulled tight off of it. Not drawn that way, but I told you. I want to pick a register that's going to hit terminal velocity at approximately 3 quarters of the distance between the register and the outside wall. Here to here is 10 feet. I want to pick a register that hits terminal velocity at seven and a half feet. He asked me what terminal velocity is. He wants to know what terminal velocity is, right? And terminal velocity is a, a moving target, per se. A manufacturer of supply grills will tell you that we use 100 feet per minute. Another one might say that they use 50 feet per minute. Essentially, what they're referencing is when the bulk of the momentum has been used up, and we're going to have air coming out of that register. When we get to here, it's running out of momentum and then is going to do this. Right? And then I'm going to be right here with a smile on my face. Right? And I'm going to be super happy because the air isn't hitting me in the forehead. Sometimes people will do things that are different. Now, if I'm using single stage equipment or zoning, I like this strategy. If I'm using VRV stuff, I'm not going to run at 30 or 40 percent of my capacity because if I don't have the throw, I'm going to turn that smile into a frown because then the airs hit me in the head. That's my favorite strategy for an overhead system where I'm delivering the air from above. And I don't care if it's a cooling or a heating climate. In fact, I like that in a heating climate. Russ King uses the, uh, the analogy of blow the air in the direction it doesn't want to go because then it promotes mixing. And that's what this is all about. We, we need runtime. We don't want to blow the air on people. And we need mixing. Mixing creates the, or it reduces the stagnation. And stagnation creates the bigger temperature difference. The bigger temperature differences are going to create what we know as the opposite of comfort, right? People are going to be aware of their surroundings. The other thing that I like to point out, we're looking at this from above. That's a room. The last one we did, that was a, a window, and I put my register here, and it was blown in that direction. Two, maybe a three-way register. That's what makes me happy. And even a one-way register wouldn't make me upset. What I don't like is that guy. And what's this guy? A round register. What is the point of blowing conditioned air towards an interior wall? There isn't. There's one redeeming quality of a round register. Anybody know what it is? That's a velocity thing, and you are correct. You work with any knuckle drag and mouth breathers? They can't put it in crooked. 
the same thing as a four-way, right, a, a rectangle. You can mess that one up. Can't mess the round one up. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was listening to a fella the other night talking about their. I don't know if he was in the process of trying to make it happen or he overheard. It was they were trying to make a combination diffuser uh, light for that exact scenario. But there was some you. Uh, there was some kind of a UL issue with. Temperatures of stuff, they were afraid of something hitting dew point and, yeah. and you know. Out, it yeah, it had something that, no, it had something more to do with black holes and shooting through space and Elon Musk was involved. <laughs> Not 100% sure, it might have been a different conversation. But yeah, that's, that's some good stuff. All right. Oh, we're going to have time to talk about filters. Cool. Right. Size of the filter. Let's use math instead of guessing. Again, I'm like in fifth grade with being able to use these cool things. CFM is equal to area times velocity. Area is in square feet. Velocity is in feet per minute. We can manipulate this formula to solve for this. If we know what our airflow is going to be and we want to limit this to, say, 300 feet per minute, we know how many square foot of filter area we need. This is the only reference to filter velocity that I'm aware of in manual D. I spoke to this earlier. I said manual D is going to force us to determine what our velocity is with the use of populating the friction rate worksheet with the pressure drop of the filter that we're going to use. So we have to look it up. But in a filter grill, it's just saying 300 feet per minute. Don't exceed that. And that, that's a good number. If you look through filter grill manufacturers, and I get these backwards all the time, you might know this rule of thumb, and this is a quality rule of thumb. The 2 CFM, 2 square inches per CFM, is that 200 square inches per ton? Does that sound like something for a filter grill? Are you familiar with that? Because I think it works out to 150 feet per minute for a filter grill. Okay, and that's it. So it's, it's two, CFM, uh, two square inches per CFM is how it works out. So that works out to, when you do the math and the free area and all, you end up with a velocity of 150 feet per minute. You get quality filtration at a low velocity like that. But when you start doing the math for a three-ton system, are you going to put three 25 by 25 return girls in? I don't know. But that's why we have to do math. So... Let's address, well, let's see. I had a, uh, an actual copy of, of this, a physical copy of this book versus the old version here. This old version here is saying that manual J only, excuse me, manual D only recognized 350 feet per minute for the grills. Now the most recent number is something along the lines of 300 for a filter grill, 500 for a stamp metal uh, bar grill. We really shouldn't be looking to manual D for grill and register information. We should be looking at manual T. Did I do my leisure suit routine with manual T yet today for you guys? Was it in this class or the other class? All right, well, for you guys that missed the leisure suit thing, I was talking to a guy, and he wants to put some curriculum together about manual T, and I brought up the fact that I have to wear my leisure suit if I'm going to talk about manual T because the physical book is from 78, 81, leisure suit type uh, era. And he's laughing. The other person involved in the conversation was probably under 30. And she didn't get it. And then when I explained it, she says, well, maybe it's time to update that book. And I said, maybe, but the properties of air haven't changed in the last 50, 60, turn of the last century since, right? So it doesn't really matter. The principles are the same, but the leisure suit would be pretty cool. Five? Fifteen? I had a conversation today with somebody, and they, it, it wasn't a, a setup or anything like that. We got into the discussion about filters and all, and they said, you know, there should be a chart or something that shows you what size 
opening is enough for whatever size filter at a given velocity. Well, I was like, Harvey Kaplan, I don't know if anybody recognizes that name. Harvey's been a fixture in education. Uh, he's in the, the Baltimore area. He gave me this chart every bit of 15 years ago. And it's nothing more than doing length times width divided by 144, which is how you turn square inches into square feet. And we come up with a filter size equaling tons. This is a rule of thumb, but this is one of those quality rules of thumb. So it's showing us a real common size. And that is the most friendly, recognizable, repeatable size that we see. 16 by 25 by 1, 400 square inches, 2.777 square feet. 833 CFM will pass through a area that size. And that works out to 2.08 tons. How often do you see a 16 by 25 by 1 filter in applications that need more than 800 CFM on a, a regular basis? In fact, uh, I don't have it in this slide deck. I have an example with these numbers. A, it doesn't matter what manufacturer it is because I can find it on three or four different manufacturers. In fact, I can find the opening because the furnaces are getting shorter a furnace with a three-ton drive that the, the side on the furnace is 14 by 25 by 1, and it supports a, a three-ton drive. So theoretically, at 400 CFM per nominal ton, that's 1,200 CFM. You do the math for an opening that size, we're approaching 600 feet per minute. That is a tremendous velocity. We're going to end up with pressure drops of 0.3 or 0.4. It's going to be even 0.2 two with a cardboard frame disposable fiberglass filter. And it might not go that high because the filter might just say and step out of the way and it just lets all the crap go through it. You have those customers. I change that filter all the time. It never gets dirty. It's because the stuff's just going right through it. So they put a decent filter in and then we have a 0.4 or 0.5 drop. And then somebody will say that filter's no good. It's not that the filter's no good, it's not big enough. And it's when we need two, doesn't mean this, it means this. Surface area, it's a big deal. All right, I thought that the folks that published this information were being purposely deceitful. And I think they still are, but the way they get away with it is they're still following the rules. 52.2 is an ASHRAE standard that states that they have to publish this information for MERV and pressure drop at any one of these seven velocities. So what most of them do is publish at that, I thought it was 149, I was off. 118 feet per minute, and that's because it's something metric stuff. When I was in sixth grade, I thought we'd kick that back across the pond. No metrics. You know, spirit of 76, no metric. Uh, it's invading our shores again. This number is realistic. So again, when I become king, every filter will have a pressure drop and airflow stamped on it, or everybody has to do a, a published pressure drop at this 295. I want it to be 300, but I won't squabble. I'll take 295. And I think it would alleviate at least 5% of the problems that we have because at least 5% of the people pay attention to this stuff. And maybe I'm exaggerating, it might be 10% actually pay attention to this. But it's one of those things that just gets so overlooked. It's, well, I don't want to say it's disheartening because if people did everything right, I might not have a job. So I like it when they do things wrong and I can sound smug and say, well, you have too high of a pressure drop. Meh, meh, give me money, right? It's, it's a good thing. So I want people to keep doing stuff wrong because I, I prefer the, the low-hanging fruit, right? I don't want to have to do anything. I just want to talk about it and get paid and move on. That's words to live by? I don't know. Minimum effort for maximum effect? But this is it. This is, there's no hidden agenda here. What the manufacturers do is they publish their information at numbers that we most likely won't ever see. 
but there is at least six contractors in the continental United States that will purposely design filters at this 118 or 246 number, and everybody else just accepts whatever kind of crap happens when you're in these big numbers over here. So you can be in the low number squad or I don't care squad. It's entirely up to you, but I think and I'm, I'm sincere when I say this, I might be, might be the first one that ever pointed this stuff out to you. And now you're going, well, it makes perfect sense why everything's so wonky. But then you're like, how am I going to fix it? Well, you got two choices. You can put double or triple the surface area of filter in or put a five-ton drive in everything. Because if you have a five-ton drive in everything, you have enough oomph to overcome those 0.4 and 0.5 drops. But that's not realistic. So you got to put more surface area of filter in. If you live in a filter grill area, you put triple what you used to in. If you live in a market where you have enough room to put four inch pleated filters, you can, and I won't say this with complete conviction, but I'll say there's a solid chance that you can keep your pressure drops under 0.2 if you go with four inch filters. And the four and five ton, eh, you probably can't. You probably got to use two of them. Again, uh huh, uh huh. There are some, yeah, April Air has some, some pretty good stuff. I saw, and actually I probably have a picture in here of one that Joel did, and it's a five ton, he's got the coffin box, big ass filter, and it can be done, but it, it has to be a conscious effort. That's my attic, and there's almost like a heavenly glow around that meter, isn't there, man? It's, it wasn't on purpose, just the way it worked out. I got a two ton air handler in my attic, it's usually running closer to 600 CFM typically, connected to a two-stage piece of equipment. That is the pressure drop, and I, I want to say it is on low speed, but I won't guarantee it. It doesn't matter. It just points out that you can have pressure drops lower than 0.1 if you put some effort into your design. I literally change that filter maybe once every 18 months to two years. I don't get a measurable pressure drop across it in a year, so why would I change it? Right? It's in a hot ass attic. It goes up to like a bazillion degrees. So if it's collecting any germs, it's got to be killing them. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But, uh, but realistically, you can enjoy these really nice pressure drops if you do a little math. A little bit of math. I guess it's good that I'm good at this easy math. I can't spell. We already covered that, right? So, do you laugh at that, or do you say genius? It's a substantial amount of surface area. That's why I keep doing, huh? Ah. It is. And this was a particular gentleman's house that got into that hole. It's supposed to be a 0.5 external static pressure. We can put a giant coil in. This manufacturer lets you put in a evaporator coil that might say 048 or 060 on it. They got an adjustable expansion valve paired with an 030 or even an 024 outside. You can end up with a pressure drop of 0.1 or less across the wet evaporator coil, we can end up with a pressure drop of less than you know, 0.1 on that amount of filter area, 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It, it wasn't under 0.5, but it was like 0.52. And this was partly done out of spite, but I kept saying it can happen, it can happen, and it can happen. I think the most, it was double the wager we had last night, and I bet a nickel. I want a dime. It was pretty cool. But it was more about the satisfaction of, I'm telling you, I'm not making this stuff up. It'll work, and it works. That's Joel's job. That's the same filter, I believe, that you, that you have in your picture right there. So if that's a five-ton piece of equipment, and his external static pressure is under a half inch on there. What's so. the difference I don't know. Yeah, you can get more organized flow. If you're putting it on the side of the air handler, the top of the filter doesn't get as dirty as the bottom. Then you start getting into turning veins and stuff like that. That's actually a garage. But to your point, uh, the more organized the air can get entering into a filter, the more even the load's going to be on the filter. I've seen some exaggerated uh, examples, and it's not because they exaggerated it. It was because the return drop 
and the easiest way to explain it, a filter was placed right here, and when the air comes down from here's real dirty, up here might not be filtering any air. I have a, a 10 inch wide return drop in front of the filter in my basement system, and I have one turning vane that I bent on my Black & Decker work, workmate when I first moved in, because for the first uh, two, three weeks that we lived there, when I pulled the pre-filter out of the uh, air cleaner, across the top, almost the top third, didn't have anything, the bottom did have loading. I, again, just bent it up, shoved it in there. The next time I pulled it out, like four years later to change my filter, you know. The loading was equal, so I exaggerate. It wasn't made four years, but I'm shoemaker has no shoes. It could, very well could have been. Yes, four. So what do we got here? We spoke about this a little bit in the last class, and this is super important. You can find this from guidance that's 20, 30, 40, 50 years old, because this is all stuff that's never going to change. If you do that, no matter what you do, it's going to be like these two guys. It's going to be noisy, right? There's nothing you can do to reduce the noise. Now, I've tried. I've had houses where we literally have taken a piece of duckboard and went like this in a metal duct, and a piece of duckboard and went like this to make the air go like this. And this is within the last, I'm going to say, iPhone 4 or iPhone 5 time frame. And the reason I use that as a reference when I had my first iPhone 4, it had that, what's the meter for measuring noise? Decibel meter, you could get one of them back then. I have them on my phone now. And we saw a measurable drop. It was still noisy. But we saw a measurable drop. So if you can make the air go around and not have line of sight to the fan, you can make it quieter. The easiest way to do it is just follow this reasoning or this guidance. Make the air turn twice, no line of sight, the amount of noise you're going to get from your blower motor, you're not going to eliminate it, but you can significantly reduce it. Like this is a townhouse condo. You stick the furnace right up against the wall and put it on the floor. Again, I, the guy who decided to do that, I want him like this for about 30 seconds. And right from behind, I'm giving him one of these. Because all you got to do is put that furnace up on a box let the air have to change directions, and I don't, I'm making this up because I don't actually know, but I'm going to reduce the sound maybe by half, keep the velocity in check, maybe put a, a, a grill on both sides so I can keep my velocities under 500 feet per minute. We'll know the words, and the air goes through, and it doesn't hum. So I like the way that stuff works out. I used to share bad info, and this is it. 30 by 30, why not 25 by 25? I'm going to go through all the math real quick and show you why this guy right here came out at 322 feet per minute. And that's too high. I want it under 300 feet per minute. And then I did 30 by 30. And I used to use a random 0.8 multiplier for free area on filter grills. And I found out that might not be such a good idea. Because I went hunting. Was that hard? Was it painful? No. I went hunting and I started actually looking at information from grill manufacturers. And I hunted for quite a while because I started taking their AK factor, AK factor, which is a representation of free area on their grills, and actually doing math and determining it's 0.66. I did it again in a desperate attempt to find something that was matching my 80%. And I was coming up with numbers like 0.69. I always backed it up with look it up. Because I found out that by 80% free area is very sus, right? I shouldn't be sharing that number because as much as I tried, I couldn't find a return grill with 80% free area. That's why I always finish everything up with, look it up, because I was given bad info. And I've done that in the past, so. Really. All right, I do want to share this one. If you guys aren't, I had like six or eight new followers. Snapchat, I'm telling you, my stories rock. And one more, wait a second. I got some, this is big news. I got a new email address. That's me in a couple weeks. I'm going to be the manager of HVACR design for ACA. So, uh, nice job.
Thank you. Nobody knows it yet, so don't tell anybody. They, they came to me, man. <laughs> I applied for a job like 10 times. They kept saying no. They finally gave up. I am. I'm going to get the free ones. Actually, you can get a hold of me any of these ways. If you want a copy of the presentation and all that stuff, anything that I, I have currently, I'll share. So if you're looking for content, if you're a teacher or whatever, uh, just ask. That's, that's me and my gang. Actually, that, it's, it's, it's not up yet. It's actually more of a joke. You know what? Let me do it this way. The easiest way to get a hold of me, and it's a short one, edj at ehcc.org. Got to put the dash in there. Hey, thanks to Ed. Thanks to you for taking the time to listen to this. If you are interested in attending this year's symposium, go to hvacrschool.com slash symposium. Thanks for watching. Thanks for watching our video. If you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to hvacrschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing, you can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.